during this time, which obviously is so dark and challenging in a lot of ways that I feel like the feedback I'm hearing more than ever before is just that this show brings people joy and that it feels like an escape from this moment into a world that is colorful and, and celebrates strong women and, and, uh, and that it feels like everyone has something to connect to, whether it's one character in particular or an experience that they're going through or New York City or the Catskills or, you know, it's, um, it's, it's nice to know that, that we're making some people laugh when I think it's, it's a bit hard to. Everyone, welcome to Paley Fest LA. I'm Jessica Radloff, the West Coast editor at Glamour, and I am delighted to be your host for this very special Paley conversation with the cast and creatives from the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Thank you also to the festival's official card, City, for helping to make this event possible. This program, of course, is presented by the Paley Center for Media, a nonprofit organization dedicated to honoring excellence in television through educational programs, great conversations with the stars and stories tellers of critically acclaimed series like the one we are about to celebrate today and the preservation of television's creative legacy through the Paley Archive. To learn more and to become a member, please visit paleycenter.org. So today we are absolutely thrilled to welcome the gifted creative team of Amazon's acclaimed series, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And just as a housekeeping note, this special conversation will happen in two parts because we do have 14 cast members with us. The first part will focus on Midge's personal life with her family and friends. The second part will focus more on her career and the people that she meets throughout her journey doing stand-up. So with that said, joining us for part one are creator and executive producer, Amy Sherman Palladino and Daniel Palladino. My absolute favorite cast, we have Rachel Brosnahan, Alex Borstein, Tony Shaloub, Marin Hinkle, Michael Zegan, Kevin Pollack, Caroline Aaron, and Stephanie Hsu. Welcome everybody. Hello. 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 Hey. Congratulations on 20 nominations. That is just phenomenal. Oh, many blowjobs. What? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, word, word number three. Huh? It's, a, it's a new record. Why stop? Uh, me, me as well. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Well, <laughs> let me just tell you all, I rewatched all of season three yesterday, and I am just as much in love with it as I was before, but I found it so much more even relevant and timely considering the time that we're at in the world. But Amy and Dan, I need to ask you, there is a particular scene in the finale episode that I, I could not believe what I was seeing. Um, I think Michael and Stephanie can speak to this because when May shows up at Joel's club, she brings him a gift. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, yes. She brings him a roll of toilet paper, <laughs> oh, which I funny. thought was very romantic and very practical. And we need it back, Michael. And now you can't get any, <laughs> so there you go. So More romantic now than it's ever been. Yeah. That's the new housewarming gift. We should auction that off, huh? Auction off the one remaining roll of toilet paper <laughs> in the world. I really, I was like, where did she come up with this? Because talk about now if there would have been Clorox wipes, I would have been like, okay, this is too surreal here. But I thought that was funny. Um, so Amy and Dan, talk to me a little bit about the significance that season three not only had for you at the time of release, but even more so now. There are just so many timely relevant issues. Um, what does it mean to have this show uh, out there right now uh, in the time we're in? Well, you know, we weirdly, like, we never approach shows like that. We always approach shows just purely from what the character journey is. And then if the world happens to fall into place, we pretend we're brilliant. And um, it, it's, it's, you know, this was, um, we were weirdly looking through old notes of ours the other day because we're spending a lot of time together. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> great. <laughs> I just love him. I love him. He's adorable. Anyhow, um, um, but we were actually weirdly going through some old notes and we, we found this paper that we had typed up um, the very, very first season before we had started shooting 
And literally, it was like season one, we're going to do this. Season two, we're going to do this. And it said like season three, she goes on tour. But I mean, literally, we had season three like pretty, pretty closely blocked out. Um, and this is back when the, the the last name wasn't even Weissman yet. It was, well, yeah. it was something else. It, it was, was like I, I have Weinberg. Notes. Weinberg. Yeah. It's like it was like literally like way way early. Um, so like the thought process was already there. It, it's. What, what was wonderful for us this year is is to because our because Midge's journey is always for her world to expand and to get bigger and to experience different things and we were so excited to take her on this tour with with Shy and his world and and really like have like I I actually think this year was more fun than we've ever had like it was just really sort of um, big and expansive. And we got to, you know, dig into the kinds of stuff that we, you know, with Shy and his story and who he is and the fact that, that, you know, he looks like he's on top of the world, but there's so many things that he had to keep private and secret to, to have what they, you know, wanted. That part of it was very exciting for us. And, and then just, personally to have her go through her journey of she's walked away from a marriage she's still kind of got a thing for her husband she's trying to be the woman that has it all she's trying to juggle the kids she's trying to make sure that she follows this great ambition that has been driving her all the way through this and and all of that sort of mixed together which could have been a gigantic disaster I think turned out I think it turned out okay so we're 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 very pleased with the season and we got to do so much music and write original music and I don't know we just had a lot of fun and we built a whole new club for Joel I mean come on so it we just we it, there was building there was nails and hammer and toilet paper what more can you want from from your third season well it's so true i mean every episode is such a cinematic achievement it is like a movie um i've never seen anything like it on television before um and for the actors you know one thing i want to ask you is that watching your performances i'm so blown away it feels like you're always being asked to pat your head rub your tummy and stand on a tightrope as you do these scenes because there is so much required of you and Kevin is is nodding his head. <laughs> is this the most challenging and exhilarating role that you have ever played? Whoever wants to jump into that? Times infinity. Times infinity. <laughs> yeah. Most challenging and rewarding for the reasons you just gave. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I said a lot during the first season that you know, on most television shows, as much as you have to prepare and, and know your lines, you know, during during moments when I felt like I, I couldn't see through to the next day, I would go, it's like you have to, you have to, you know, you can't just know your lines, you have to know them upside down and backwards and doing cartwheels at the same time. And, but, but when you do, when everyone does, and when all the pieces come together, when the, when the camera dancing with the actors and in space is just right and when the lighting design is beautiful and, and the background actors are decked out in these gorgeous period clothes when it all comes together it's it's magic it's the kind of magic that i feel like with so many theater actors in this space that we i thought was reserved for the stage and it's been a really cool cool part about working on this show uh, one of the other cool parts that I loved is to see Caroline and Kevin and Tony and Marin share so many scenes together. We've never seen the Weissmans and the Maisels all together so much. It was kind of like they were quarantining together. Again, another like, uh, little, little, little. it felt so relevant. I'm, I'm thinking they really are quarantining together. Um, so for the four of you that I just mentioned, talk about getting to play off of each other because there's just, I'm so blown away by all the talent in that room. What was it like getting to share these, these incredibly hilarious scenes together? Well, they always was, think that you don't, if you want your tennis game to get better, play with somebody who's better than you. And that's how I always feel when the four of us are together is it's, it's pretty amazing how the other three raise your game. Standing over uh, Tony and Marin in the bedroom when, when we wake them at 4.30 or whatever to move the car, just them pretending to be asleep and getting <laughs> over them. 
was a joy I've never known. I don't think Tony was pretending. No, I, Tony's <laughs> actually very good at pretending, to, pretending a, to be asleep. He's a method sleeper. I've, I've, built, I've built an entire career on that, actually. <laughs> yeah, they put us in such close proximity that, um, you know, they're, they're, along with all the challenges, as Rachel said, of, of dancing and singing and talking at the same time, um, uh, to, to, to play in this sort of uh, alchemy of uh, the four of us, yeah, it was it was beyond special and magical for me. I don't know how the ever felt. So, yeah. Having a meal with these guys is pretty fun. I would have to say it. It, it uh, of all the of all the scenes we've done for uh, for me anyway, the, this section of season three kind of felt like the most strangely the most intimate uh, <laughs> that we that 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 uh, my character. I think more. In, you might you might agree here it's because because of the kind of the the pressure cooker uh uh com aspect of that of that of their household um it it there's just so much tension and and, and, and in a sense that brings out this kind of this kind of strange uh intimacy that you the kind you don't like i guess you'd say <laughs> the dining table stuff too oh my goodness and we did get to send Marn out in the middle of the street in Queens to scream at Caroline for about six hours, which <laughs> that was pretty fun. Was immensely enjoyable, I have to tell you. It was just one of my favorite. Cathartic. <laughs> and Caroline was so like, I don't understand why you're doing this. It was just, it was my, <laughs> one of my favorite moments. It was so great to watch. And I was going to say, you know, Marin and Tony, what we witnessed with Rose and Abe this season, I mean, talk about rebuilding your life and, and going through a whole midlife crisis. What did you appreciate about Rose and Abe's storyline this season? I love that there's so little in a way that you have to do and prepare. I mean, except as what Rachel said, you have to know your lines inside and out. You have to be able to move around. But you, you, you just kind of respond to the truth of what these extraordinary actors are offering. And so I find myself on set, like it's like an otherworldly place you go where you don't, when it finishes, you don't even know what happened. And, and, and then when you, you know, later watch the episode, I kind of, it, it's hard to believe that 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 is where you actually were. I don't know if you guys experienced that too. I think at one point Luke mentioned the same thing. It's um, it, it's like so exhilarating, and it's what Rachel said. It's it, the only thing I can compare it to is the theatrical high you have when you're when you've rehearsed something so much that then you let go, and it's like surfing. You don't even know how you're going to stand or when you're going to fall or what wave you're going to hit. And I love that about what about what we got to do. Yeah, talk to me also, Alex, I want to bring you into this because one of my favorite scenes is when you are all in Miami. It's it's Alex, it's Marin, and it's Tony. And Marin slash Rose is getting completely plastered. And of course, we don't get to see the three of you all, you know, together all often. That too, you know, too much. But what was it like doing those scenes and, and playing Rose completely drunk and just throwing insults at each other? I loved it so much. Um, I, I, you know, alcohol brings out sometimes the worst and sometimes the best. And in that particular day, I felt like we got to see a side of Rose, which is, is quite delicious. And may, may, you know, our writers and creators allow her to drink just as much as possible because it, it's so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you like other people. And I love, I, I've worked. I'm so lucky to work with Tony and Rachel primarily. That's kind of most of my, the bulk of my work is. I've wanted to work with Alex for so long. We've only had a couple scenes together. So that day was just such a delight to actually be in her space and be getting drunk with her. So now you never want to do it again. I, oh, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, it was the same old for me. I mean, I was, I'm, I'm kind of a bitchy little cunt and no matter who I'm. <laughs> But you're our bitchy little cunt, honey. You're yeah. I mean, it was fun to kind of go toe to toe with Rose. Um, there was a monologue in that that um, I wrote for Alex because I just thought if as long as Rose is going to be drunk, let's just throw, throw Alex's drunk thing in there too, which literally is one of my favorite Alex drunk moments because Alex actually doesn't in real life. I think I've only seen you drunk like a couple times. You're not like a big drinker. Um, so very good, very good drunk. Okay. Very good drunk, okay. excellent drunk. 
Yeah, I don't know. I don't like playing drunk. I don't. I feel like it's it's never authentic. The only person I've ever liked who did it was Dudley Moore. You know. Yeah. yeah. Like everyone else, I feel like it's like okay, now they're now they're pretending to be drunk. Yeah, it's you know, hard. It's one of the weirdly the hardest things to do as an actor. Drunk and stoned, I feel like, are really hard. <laughs> yeah. Well, and show up on time. That too. <laughs> I thought you were going to say doing scenes in Miami and that heat. You had heat stroke, and that was a, I think that would be harder than anything for you based on what I've heard of, of those scenes. And I want to get to the Miami stuff in a minute, but I first want to, want to talk to Stephanie and Michael because you guys have such amazing chemistry together. It was so fun to watch this season. But Stephanie, I, I read an interview where you were saying that you've never seen a Chinese American woman portrayed like this, and you truly loved playing. May. So talk to me a little bit about what was so important to you about this role, what you loved most about her. Yeah, well, you know, it's one of those things where when I first heard that this role was um, available, um, before I even read the script, I, was, I thought to myself, like, what kind of Chinese character is in the 1950s, you know? Um, because most of the time you read things that are really bad <laughs> and um, pretty uh, stereotypical or just um, uninformed. And I remember reading um, the audition and the, uh, the scene for episode one, and I was just so completely floored because I just had never seen a character like May before. Um, and a character that was a Chinese American woman in a period piece but was also smart and strong and contemporary for her time um, to get to play a character that was also diving into a historic period was was so cool and really, um, really important and powerful for me personally. And I was so grateful for Amy and Dan and all the research that they did and permission to play that they gave and also Michael for being such a sweetie pea and uh, <laughs> you know, being so warm and welcoming to to a new, some new blood. And I appreciate the fact that Stephanie thinks we did research, because I think that's <laughs> kind of amazing. And thank you, Stephanie, for that. <laughs> part, of, part of Maisel and the reason that we said at a time we did for Midge was it's a time of change and it's a time of you know, that Midge was sort of caught in this moment where comedy was changing and going into the 60s, like the culture is going to be changing. And what we really wanted to do with May is, is, is make her a, a girl who is obviously of, a, you know, Chinese tradition background, but she's also American. So she's also bridging that change from what is a tradition, what is her traditional role or what would it have been if she was living back in China? Um, and what is she maneuvering into? And how is she um, making that change, the, the decision to be a doctor at a time when women really didn't do the doctor thing? You know, um, it, it was, for Joel, the important thing for us in, in casting Stephanie was we kept looking for like, who's the girl that people are gonna believe that Joel's head is gonna be turned from, from Midge. Like, because Midge is, not only is she, you know, like adorable, because you are, Rachel, but it, you know, that she's, she's, she's very strong and she's very funny and she's very independent and she's got her own mind. And even though those things wound up breaking up the marriage, it's the thing that drew him to her in the first place. And the one thing that we couldn't do is put a, another woman in there that wasn't going to be of equal power because I don't think you would ever believe that Joel would, would even consider that. You know, that would, not be, that would not be a turn on for him. Yeah, he tried it with Penny Pan in the, in the first season and he realized that's not the future for him. And we read a lot of really delightful, delicious, beautiful girls. And there was one May and it was Stephanie. That was it. She walked in, we're like, and scene. That was it. That was it. We're done. I love it. I was going to say, we need more scenes in season four between Midge and May, because I feel like there's so much unspoken language there. Oh, we'll get them. Yeah. <laughs> and to see Rachel and Stephanie together, I cannot wait for that. Um, Michael, talk to me about what was the most exciting 
uh, scene or, or the most challenging part uh, for you in season three? Because we see you fighting in a bar, we see you embark on this new romance, you're getting married again to Midge. Um, what was most exciting for you? I'd say the dancing. Oh, the dancing. <laughs> I mean, yeah, really, really all of it. I had, I, I felt like I got to do so many cool things uh, this past year and um, challenging, well, uh, you know, acting drunk, as we talked about, is, is quite challenging. And, but that was a really fun scene when, when we're at the uh, casino um, in Vegas and, and Rachel and I were drunk. And then the next morning, I, 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 I don't know, I just think those were my favorite. That was, that was my favorite episode where Joel goes to Vegas and, um, and we have that big argument. I just like arguing with Rachel. She knows this. <laughs> <laughs> On and off screen. Yeah. And yeah. in, that, in that sequence, we also got to see Midge and, uh, and Joel as they were before the breakup. We saw them yeah. having a lot of fun. We saw them joking. We saw him going to get uh, an autograph or a lip, a lip stain thing. So it was a way to like sort of turn the clock back and, get, and sort of see what their marriage was before it unraveled. It was fun. I, I, I love that because, you know, I love the flashbacks when you see what, you know, when things were good between them. I love that because it's, you know, I just feel like those scenes kind of sway the audience uh, from hating Joel to maybe coming around to him. Although at this point, like people just- people hate you him. anymore. Yeah, yeah, I don't need to defend him. Although, you know, I just think there are some <laughs> people who, who still just can't get over it, but you know what, screw them. <laughs> Take that, Alex. No, it, it, was, it was really fun to get to dive into to that part of their relationship and to, you know, I, I love the way their relationship is evolving. That also feels really modern and interesting that, that at the end of the day, even though they both have new interests, both career-wise and relationship-wise at times, that they, they can't quit each other, that they're kind of each other's safe space. And, and it feels like, you know, for a comedy, that that's a really nuanced and, and different portrayal of a marriage today and, and also in the 1950s. Yeah, you all just make it look so effortless, which is, I know it's not, I know it's anything but effortless, and yet you make it look like the most seamless experience that you all just did in one take. Um, and speaking of these oneers, uh, Amy, episode 305, when you guys go to Miami, and we open with that opening shot of the fountain blue. And we see Miami and this hotel through Midge's eyes. You take the viewer on this experience. I, I just can't get over your vision. Um, how did you even plan that? Did you, did you go to Miami ahead of time and spend time in that hotel to know how this was gonna play out? Like, how, walk me through your mind to create something so genius. Okay, well, it's it's a terrifying space to be, but um, no, you know. But here's the thing: when when you when you have people like um, Jim McConkey and his brother Larry McConkey, who are uh, Steadicam geniuses, and you have David Mullen, who it doesn't I don't know cinematographer doesn't even it doesn't even work. It's like he's a wizard. He's another worldly creature from. You know, he's like Yoda, but taller. I don't know. He's like, he's, he's, you, when you ha have people like that, <clears throat> you can do things like, hey, I would love the car to pull up and for us to pan down and see the car and they get out and they have a scene and I want to go with them and then I want to walk them all the way into the thing and then I want to see the whole room. So I want to like kind of go up and then I want to catch her on the other side and I want to bring her right in and then Alex slides in. How do we do that? So it's, it's, you can't do that with normal humans because they will like, they will either kill you or quit or say, you know, who needs this shit, you know, and, and. And we, we hit the chandelier a few times. And we yeah, did almost, almost, we almost killed Rachel. We did almost, almost take the chandelier out, but, but it was okay. Almost lost but our security deposit. It became one of those things where the Conky brothers, they go off in the woods and they stand there and they, they're in like a, like a Unabomber kind of like a hut and they, Doing and they playing. tape things and they do things and they, it was a double Moby hand. We had three cranes, we had two cranes. We had crane, crane, we had two, two cranes and three handoffs of a Moby, which is a, 
which is Larry McConkey will hold it and then it will go onto a magnet onto a crane and the crane will take it to another piece. Then, then Larry's got to run around, catch the cranes, come down, take it off and walk with it again. It's a, it was weirdly probably the most complicated, even though like, I don't think that it looks like the most complicated one, or I think there's other winners that we've done that it's like, that looks way more complicated. This was so ridiculously hard. Um, and it was a thing that it was one thing and then I will go, you know, I mean, if we have to cut here and do this part separate, we can. And then they're like, no, 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 we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. We, we, we don't, we don't want to cut. We don't want to cut. So it's like, it's a lot of like, I mean, if you want to break my heart and disappoint me, that's okay. I'm a big girl. I can take it. Um, and I'm telling you between the two Unabombers and David Mullen, the, most genius cinematographer in the entire world they come back and they invent these ways of doing things that just it's otherworldly it's and and we almost broke the chandelier but we did it we did it and the chandelier is just fine but how do you keep it all straight in your head when you're also doing scenes that are set in New York and you're filming at Steiner in these episodes because it, it goes from Miami to New York and you're also directing episode 306. How do you keep that straight? Do you Were you just shooting Miami at once and then going back to New York? How did you do that? Yeah, we, I, we, we tend to like sort of divide up duties. Like last year, I was a little more in charge of Catskills and she was more in charge of Paris. And then this year I took Vegas because I'm a degenerate gambler and it was natural for me to do that. And I got Florida, and it was 400 Florida degrees in the shade. Amy loves the sun. I love it. She <laughs> loves it. The She's sun. always going on and on about and the And iguanas, sun. they're this big. I just so loved it. The Vegas episodes, there were two in a row. I wrote and directed both of those. And then Amy wrote and directed both of the Miami shows. So it, it, helps, it helps both of us to like, one of us takes a big chunk of this right. so that the other one could do something else and vice versa so it's a lot of division of duties it also means when like he's crazed in in and deep in the weeds in vegas i can say because i'm not deep in the weeds i can go oh hey remember this person doesn't have a head and he'll be like oh that's right we need a head for this person so it's like it it it, it helps that there's somebody who's a little bit can be stand back a little bit because you're so in it that they can go remind you like you, you they've got to turn the camera on oh that's right you know so like things things like that really really do help and learning that in florida at four o'clock every day there will be a thunderstorm that will shut you down that was the other thing that we learned so we, we quickly learned that we had to get all of our work done by four in the afternoon. And it rains iguanas in my It rains iguanas. <laughs> They're really big. Big, hot Big, iguanas. hot, rainy iguanas. <laughs> okay. I, I feel like Rachel and Alex know this because I tell them all the time in person, but the two of them together, they're brilliant apart, but you put the two of them together and I've never seen a duo like this. And the physical comedy <laughs> between you all, it, it's just mind blowing. And the dramatic scenes this season. But we need to talk in Miami first when Midge is walking down the stairway to nowhere and Rachel's mannerisms. I, I don't know, like, how did you do that? That staircase, you just, I don't know how you made it come to life in the most hilarious Midge way possible. So I want you to talk about doing the stairway scenes, but then also you and Alex talk about the swimming pool scenes. I know it was hell on earth to film, but my God, that is the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. So just talk about being brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of challenging shots, that staircase to nowhere scene was another that I think doesn't doesn't look incredibly complicated, but was a real bitch to shoot. <laughs> um, it, uh, but it was amazing. I mean, there was just, we were trying to see the whole of the Fountain Blue Lobby and everyone walking down the stairs. The answer to Midge's mannerisms in that scene is something that I think, Amy, we had so many conversations about 
shooting the pilot. Like what makes Midge Midge? Who is Midge? And once we figured out what that was, I think it's just carried through every beat and every scene, which at the core is that Midge is someone who doesn't know how to do anything at less than 150. So if she's walking down the stairs, it is a full performance for herself, if no one else. Um, and and it was fun to do. Uh, Larry McConkey had his, you know, giant inspector gadget arms on and was walking backwards down the this flight of stairs and there was a crane I think in that scene too and yes. it was supposed to be a one -er with a scene with uh, uh Marin and Tony when they arrive and it was um it was crazy but I, I should let I should let Alex take the pool because we know that was her favorite scene to shoot <laughs> yeah I don't remember much I blocked most of it uh yeah, it was awful. Um, Rachel and I are both pasty, pasty white. So they had like a screen over us, but it wasn't enough. So between takes, they had to slather us with more spray and bring umbrellas. And in the meantime, all the poor extras, like no one's given a rat's ass about them. They're just frying. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, it was, it, was, it was brutal. And it was just a lot of exercise. I'm like a doughy little person. I don't need to swim for four hours. Like, what is that? Um, so it was a lot. And then there were words. Amy wanted me to say stuff while I, <laughs> while I was paddling. And uh, so the good thing is, the good thing is it's always so hard. Everything's always so hard and remembering the lines and it just makes me really angry, really, really angry. And it really works for the character. So I'm very lucky. So what you see on screen is just an angry actress losing her mind. <laughs> Just Alex's fury coming from the inside out. Yeah. That was a good scene, you guys, if you remember, that we were supposed to shoot part of it the day yeah. before, and we got rained out at four o'clock. So we literally had to cram, I don't know, it was a lot of pages into, again, before four o'clock. So a lot of that, again, was just like, you know, do it again, do it again, do it again, jump, don't cut, go, go, do it again, do it again, do it again. It was a lot of- All I remember I was, I was, in, I was in wool pants. My I was about to say. My bathing suit was wool pants cut at the knee, which was my <laughs> stupid fucking idea. <laughs> that wool is just- It was your idea, that's your fault. I I you know. had those boots and that jacket for half the scenes outside before we got in the water. So Alex was grumpy by like 10 a.m. But just but the, wet wool, the wet wool was insane. It was just, it felt like <laughs> an old Jewish man was clinging to my waist trying to pull me under the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> All I remember is us running those lines for that jump scene. Like it was midway through the day. Alex probably had heat stroke by this point. And, and we were just losing our minds and trying to remember all these lines. And Amy kept going faster, faster. And we were just like, Bruh. and then blacked out and we were done. <laughs> it was... yeah, after that scene, I went back to the room and I threw up. Like, I, I guess that's what happened with heat stroke. I threw up and then I took like a 30 minute nap and then I went and I ate an impossible amount of Cuban food. <laughs> <laughs> the typical day in Miami, actually. That's the cure Cuba. for for sunstroke. Apparently, is a all it's missing is a line of coke, and you would have been in Miami. Uh... <laughs> then, the, just, then you can spend the evening focused on like hardcore diarrhea and not the sunburn. <laughs> right. Sure. Last few things before we wrap. I do want to talk about the scene. Again, we don't get to see this pairing that often. Uh, Rachel and Kevin, when we see Midge and Moish together uh, in that last episode, when she goes to him to say she wants to buy the apartment back. And it's a very sweet, poignant scene where she's really, truly stepping into her power and say, I've, 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 you know, saved up all this money. I want it for my kids. I want the apartment for me. Um, you know, Moish is saying, I'm sorry, my son was a jerk and everything else. Talk to me about that scene because you both don't get to work together all that much. What was it like doing that? Rachel? <laughs> I say, I, I've had the great privilege of working with almost everyone on the show. And, and Kevin actually was one of the only people that I had never had a one-on-one -on -one scene with. And so it was such a treat. I mean, I I have a whole new respect also for Michael, for that, the giant, and, and Kevin, for the giant one -er that you guys did through that same space. Ooh, it is hot in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, it, but it was amazing. It, it was also, you know, when you get 
we so rarely get to sit down on the show, to be able to just sit down and act with each other. I mean, I don't need to tell you, but Kevin's an incredible actor in addition to being an incredible comedian. And it was, it was so fun. We're going to write more sitting down in season four for you. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> yeah. They're just, they're throwing up and they're they, passing out. Midge and enters and sits. Yeah. yeah we all was, get therapy in season four. <laughs> it's, it's always easier to act in scenes where the writing uh, brings out so many different shades of each character, let alone two, uh, a two-hander. Uh, so I got a little sense of what the... Uh, Midge and uh, Susie uh, banter could be like uh, to to perform because yeah, I, very few of us get to do just just two talking, and but then uh, selfishly yeah, I I I want Midge and Moish have one little moment at the Passover table or one of the in the early early first season, and uh, it was a nice little tease of what might be. So I was uh, thrilled just thrilled and and again you know we're, we're as good as our other players but also always as good as the writing will provide and so those that scene really had a lot of layers and a lot lot going on oh man a lot going on yeah yeah and Kevin speaking of layers I also want to make sure to touch on this the scene with Rachel and Marin at the end when you have Rose and Midge going at it and you both see how broken they are and they both have felt like they've had to rebuild their lives uh, because of what the men in their lives have done. I loved working on that scene Rachel I hope you know that I it, you know it's funny when we got the script I it's uh it's like getting a secret and you you don't want to tell anyone that you've just your dream has just come true as an actor. Like you have a scene that you've longed for forever. And that scene for me, I mean, for, for, three, for three years, it's been hard because Marin has such interest in Rachel's standup, but Rose has none, you know, as Amy just said. And so for a moment to, to be able to state my case of, you know, you and I are on the same page about something. We've both experienced what it means. Um, and it, and that was incredible to see eye to eye with it, with this with this as as Amy just said with this woman who's been my best friend because we've been like you know going apart 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 and to have one moment again where we like conjoin it was it was exquisite and then every single time Rachel came in to do that scene I just felt I I I just felt so she was so full and it moved me so much. And I actually thought about that, Amy, I was like, how are you ever gonna decide? Each take is that good. We have to like put out 17 versions of this scene. So it was great. I felt exactly the same way. I mean, just to, I, I love Rose's journey this season and, and I love Midge's journey this season as well. And, and that moment felt so cathartic and also to just get to throw down with Marin was so much fun. Um, it was a tough scene, but it was, but again, I felt the same way. There were so many different colors that you brought out, Marin, take to take. And it's, it's nice for that to be the foundation from which they get to build on in season four, that is you know, two generations of women who are affected differently by the time that they live in. And, and I think it, it their their relationship feels like one of the most challenging in the series to have to kind of confront each other and and yeah it's it's an, yet another moment but a really pivotal one for Midge where she has to realize that while she's the center of her own universe she isn't the center of everyone else's all the time and it's a uh, it's not an easy pill to swallow but I think it'll be really important for both of them moving forward. And there's literally nothing more fun than to do any scene where Rachel has to come in angry because <laughs> she goes outside and she runs in a circle to get her energy up and you just hear over the headphones, you just hear, <laughs> okay, and then she comes in and she marches in and it's every single time and literally it's delightful. It's just to hear the weird running in circles and the panting and then the okay and then some poor person just opens the door and she just <laughs> barrels right in it's 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 completely psychotic but like no. i never thanks thanks to amy there no character no person on the fucking planet has the amount of energy in every single moment 
as Midge does. And, and to your credit, Ames is always there to be like, I got, you know, you got to give me more. And I'm going, I'm like <laughs> lying on the floor in the bathroom, completely half passed out. And they're shoveling coffee down my throat. But yeah, they're running in circles and making weird noises. And is, is you know, you got to draw it from somewhere. But it's right. utterly psychotic. And that's why no one's allowed on set to watch it happen. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that's true. We have very good methods, don't we? <laughs> yes. This is why you guys deserve all the Emmys in the world. Um, last quick question for you all. This is from the festival sponsor, City, and they would like to know, because the show has such an intensely devoted fan base, what is the most common feedback you hear from fans of the show? People always ask what? me uh, if they think, or if I think uh, Midge and Joel are going to get back together. That's, I mean, that's what everybody asks me. Do you have a comeback to it now since you get that question all the time? Um, well, I, that's up to Amy and Dan. I have no idea. <laughs> and that's what he tells them. Yeah, that is what I tell I, I Honestly, I have no idea. Just don't give them our home address again, Michael. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. again. That was How many times can they move? Oh, man. Alex, I'm curious what happens when fans meet you. What do they, what do they say? I don't meet many, uh, which is nice. Um, I, I, people say they love the show, but they love, um, they like the, the female characters. A lot of people respond to a, a team and like seeing a female relationship represented really well. Two women kind of holding each other up and um, pushing, to, pushing the same train uphill. I think probably that. It's been really nice during this time, which obviously is so, dark and challenging in a lot of ways that I feel like the feedback I'm hearing more than ever before is just that this show brings people joy and that it feels like an escape from this moment into a world that is colorful and, and celebrates strong women and, and, uh, and that it feels like everyone has something to connect to, whether it's one character in particular or an experience they're going through or New York City or the Catskills or, you know, it's, um, it's, it's nice to know that, that we're making some people laugh when I think it's, it's a bit hard to right now. Yeah, I hear most of the time from people that all of these characters remind them of someone they know and most often love. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's really surprising the, the <clears throat> diversity of people who love the show and how they recognize these people, even though they're way too young to have it, ever lived during this period of time. I hear all the time, it just reminds me so much of my family, my mother, my aunt, my teacher, you know, they just recognize themselves in these people and they love to spend time with them. And I always get to you and Tony really not like each other and I always tell them well I like him <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I don't answer that question but um, <laughs> I I think that the the question I get most is uh, well two really uh, the first is is, is, is Alex Borstein really like that <laughs> I'm sure I, I get that a lot and I, I, I really I still haven't figured out the uh, exact right answer for that one and the, the other question I get a lot is how people just say, how do you do, how do you guys do it? How do they do it? That's, I think people are just kind of baffled by, especially people in the, in the industry. Mm -hmm. How, how, how do you pull it off? It, it's, it seems impossible. Because you have the best of the best. When you have the best cast, they can do anything. And uh -huh. I know we torture them, but I feel like I say to them often, if you guys sucked more, we wouldn't make you do this. You know, they just, they're just so good that it's literally like there's nothing that they can't do. And as a writer, there's nothing more freeing than knowing that you're not going to put anything down on paper that's not going to be able to be handled. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work because it's too long or the joke doesn't work or maybe the moment wasn't quite right, but it's never because the actor couldn't fulfill it and elevate it. And we are supremely lucky because without these people, we are really just sitting here staring at each other. We have so much respect for them. So yeah, we, we love working with actors and we always have.
Well, I congratulate you all. I thank you for the joy, like Rachel said, that you bring to the screen, to our lives. It, you are all in a class of your own. That There's just no way else to say it because I've just never seen anything like this on television. You deserve it all. And I so appreciate you being here today. A few of you are going to stick around and then we're going to bring in some of the other cast now. But um, to Marin, to Tony, to Caroline, to Kevin, to Michael, to Stephanie. I think I got everyone. Thank you guys for joining us for part one. And Rachel and Alex and Amy and Dan are going to stick around for part two. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now everyone, for the second portion of our panel, just like that, they magically appeared. Uh, we have Amy and Dan back along with Rachel and Alex, and now introducing the amazing talents that are Jane Lynch, Roy McLean, Luke Kirby, and I think it's okay to say my favorite St. Louis and ever, Sterling K. Brown. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. <laughs> you can pay me in toasted ravioli afterwards. Wow. Deal, deal, deal. Totally fine. Roy, you are so good as Shy Baldwin. I just, like phenomenal in this role. What kind of prep work did you do to take on the role of this of this showman um, in doing these these scenes, both as a performer and then, of course, when you let your guard down, uh, you know, in the later episodes, what was your prep work like? Well, I became uh, for a while there. I became absolutely obsessed with uh, with uh, Johnny Mathis and Sam Cooke. I would watch, you know, anything that I could find on um, on uh, Johnny from from that era, there's just there's a few U YouTube clips out there. So I just looked at him, looked at his mannerisms, studied him um, like crazy. Um, same with Sam Cooke, and then tried to come up with a blending of the two plus my own like energy on top of that. And then um, you know spending time in the in the recording studio, watching all the musicians put everything together. Um, watching Darius the Haas, who is absolutely just phenomenal. Um, and uh, just watching him and getting coaching from him and getting, you know, and uh, working on a physical vocabulary with uh, Marguerite Derrick, the choreographer. It just, it takes a lot of people to, to create a superstar. Um, and, uh, they, they definitely lugged me all the way there. So um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it was a Herculean effort. But you know, worth and it. You also got to perform with Sterling. I mean, we see Sterling oh playing on the show, and then of course you join him. What was it like doing that together, Sterling? When did you find out you were going to be singing uh, on the show this season? Yeah, like the day before. A couple. Of weeks before. <laughs> <laughs> I was, Dean, I was just like, "Yo, can you sing? Can you play an instrument?" I was like, "I can carry a tune." So, That's and then the tune backwards. came in. And, and first, I gotta say, it's, it's really cool for me to work with uh, with Leroy. We've known each other for a long time. New York really? theater actors. Yeah. A Yaley, I'm an NYU or whatnot. So <laughs> to finally get a chance to get together and do it on screen was a real pleasure. Yeah. Um, but like, what I love about Amy and Dan is that there's never the idea that something can't be executed in their mm -hmm. mind. It's just like how many takes will it take you to get there? <laughs> it's like, we're going to do this shit, and it's going to pop off. It's going to be great. It's gonna, how long is it going to take you? We'll, we'll wait until you're ready. So, and that's, that's what it is. And you make up your mind, you're like, oh, shit, we're going to do this until we get this shit exactly the way you did. And then you sort of release into it, and it's the most fun in the world. We had, I had a blast. It was, all, it was all live, you know, because we, you know, Darius de Haas is the actual singer. Leroy is the on-screen singer, does a beautiful lip sync. But our people wanted us to do what they always want us to do, and it's understandable. They wanted us to pre-record it and perhaps have both guys lip sync it so that we can control the sound. And Amy and I were very stubborn. We did this a lot on Gilmore Girls. We said, we want them to sing live because there's a certain energy to it. And, that a, when pl and a playfulness that you're not gonna get yeah. when, you, when you record it. And we wanted that for Sterling too. We didn't want Sterling to kind of, you know, there's a certain swagger you get when you're actually going up to actually sing as opposed to just sort of like you're going up to hit a mark to, to lip sync. So we had Darius 
standing by us. We, at built, the we built a box around Darius. And, he, <laughs> and Darius sang live, and Leroy was actually lip syncing live. So Leroy was not actually. He, he Leroy, had no visual he, he to had, go on. He, had, he was he just kind of going, well, I'm going to do this, and hopefully it'll work. <laughs> so Darius did it the exact same way every time so that yeah. Leroy could lip sync it, and then Sterling got to sing live on <laughs> camera. And for us, that's like, that's. It was really fun. Our sound people, I thought, were never going to speak to us oh, again. Oh, they were mad. They were so mad. <laughs> they were like, this is not, like, this will not. And we're like, trust us. We did this on Gilmore Girls all the time because we had no money to go to a studio in Gilmore Girls. It's yeah. like, we had no no money for water so we certainly weren't gonna they weren't gonna let us go into the recording studio so it was just but it, it was one of those things and i i think that the the deliciousness of 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 that and of the sort of challenge of like all right well this could totally suck or it's gonna have to work let's see what happens it just adds that extra sort of like and again i go it goes back to something i said earlier which is if you got the actors and they've got that great talent and skill. To me, you're almost wasting it if you don't try and do the hardest thing possible. And it's like, let's just go for it because we've got the people to go for it. If you don't, if you don't ever go for it, then you know everything's going to be nice and and clean and safe. But you're never going to have that extra little like something. I have to say, the the going for it. God, like as someone who never gets to sit in the audience and watch this stuff happen, it's always me freaking out on stage. <laughs> like it, it, I mean, I read the scene, I knew what was gonna happen. And Alex and I, I've never seen Alex so excited about literally anything as watching <laughs> Sterling like, and Leroy throw down on stage. We just kept looking at each other like, this is, <laughs> amazing to be experiencing this in real time. Like that smile on my face, my face hurt from sitting there being like, this is so incredible. They it's just, so I mean, take um, after take after take. It was such a treat. Well, I yeah. just thought they were, they were um, handsome. I wasn't oh. even listening. <laughs> you were just, just staring. Attracted to them. Was yeah. he singing? <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I, was gonna, I love when I talked to Sterling earlier this year, which seems like a lifetime ago, you were telling me, Sterling, that this is the closest thing you've ever done to theater, and it is the most exhilarating to play. What what was challenging about playing Reggie, and did you do any prep? Did you, did you talk to managers and, and people that have been working with, with, an, uh, with a performer for years to get any background? Tell me about that. Yeah, no, so... It's the closest thing to live theater I've done on camera um, because they shoot in so many waters, right? And it's a beautiful dance that the cameramen are doing with you, you know, where they're moving and you're moving together. And you know, like, if we don't get it, we'll go back to one until we get it. So there's something really exhilarating about that that you don't get always on camera because, you know, like, well, I'll just get the next tape or we'll get it in coverage or blah, 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 blah. So there's something there's the challenge of it, as, as, as Amy said, is something that I feel like us as performers and the people who are operating the cameras are like, all right, come on, we ready? You got this? You got this? We dance? Here we go. Um, in terms, I have been with my manager for 20 years. Uh, I love her uh, to pieces, Jen Wiley Stockton. And so I think about the relationship that we had, or that we have with one another, and just sort of how protective she can be of me. Um, and I was thinking about that in terms of my relationship with Shy. I was also just thinking about, like, because I talked to Amy and Dan at the beginning of the season. I was like, so what's, what's the arc? And they told me what it was. And they told me that he was going to, that he was gay. And I was like, got it, right? Like, I, I, I had this sort of, instantaneously is like he needs to be taken care of like this world that he's in is not safe for him to be his authentic self and if he doesn't surround himself with people who understand that intrinsically that he can be swallowed right and so i don't know like it, it wasn't a whole lot of research of other things there's a lot of life experience in terms of other friends of mine who are having alternative lifestyles, whether they're in entertainment or outside of it, and just recognizing that 
if they don't have allies and people who doggedly support them and protect them, that life will be more difficult. And so it was, it was more like life experience than anything else. And then when the words are there, believe me, the words are there, just have to kind of say it and fill it up as much as possible and the shit comes out the way that it does. Yeah, yeah and if I, could just, I, if I could just give Amy and Dan a shout out too, I mean, especially, you know, there's been a lot of conversation recently um, and, you know, about diversity and seeing different stories and seeing um, people of color represented in, in, in all that, that we are. And for me, I'm so proud to, to give life to uh, and be part of this, these characters of, of Shy, the relationship between Shy and Reggie, Shy and, and Midge. For me, those are refreshing, unique characters, unique relationships, that especially you know, set in this time period, I've never seen before. And I'm just, um, any time that uh, I witness that or can be part of that, to me, is it's 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 a reward in and of itself. So I just have to thank you guys so much for creating these these characters. Luke, I want to bring you into the conversation a little bit. Of course, I feel like anytime um, I talk to any fans about Lenny Bruce, they always say, you know, oh my gosh, ask and find out if if we're gonna, you know, get a romantic scene between Midge and Lenny and everything. And I know you have gotten that question so many times, and I know how Rachel feels about it too, that they should remain platonic. But instead, I want to talk to you in a way, why women love watching you so much on this show. And in my view, it's because Lenny Bruce, at least the way he's portrayed on Maisel, is he's such a modern day feminist in the way that he, he supports Midge and wants such success for her. Um, he's, he's the ally that everybody wants. Um, is that how you think of him? Do you think of him as a modern day feminist um, in the way that you play him? I do now that you said it. <laughs> um, I think, you know, one thing that if you listen to Lenny Bruce uh, a lot, um, he is obsessed with the human experience uh, from a, 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 a multitude of um, angles. Um, so I feel like, uh, you know, and, and, it's, and it's always looking for a sort of a through line of simpatico in our experience together. I think that's why he was up on the stage kind of, you know, bringing people in. Um, so, yeah, I do think it's fair to say that he would be very considerate about uh, Midge's um, experience and what she has had to endure and... Uh, and be sympathetic and thoughtful about it. So, yes. But he, he also is, wants to nail her up, right? He wants to what? He wants to nail her too, right? Oh yeah, that's a part of the course. <laughs> is that a real mustache, Luke? <laughs> yeah, can we talk? <laughs> I swear it moved. It's moved. <laughs> what is that? And can we talk about Leroy's sword? You have a sword. <laughs> <laughs> Point that I do. There's a couple swords. <laughs> Are you guys doing the Three Musketeers later? Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm working on a sort of French. I'm kind of trying to move it out towards that sort of uh, French. Uh, <laughs> Leroy, I will see you soon. <laughs> Wait, Jessica, you were you were talking about how women love watching Luke play the part. Well, I I just have to say, it's not just women. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like he, you're, Luke is a killer, and um, one of my favorite se scenes of the season was sort of that Playboy After Dark um, sort of thing, Jigger, where Rachel and Luke. It, it that was one of the most beautiful dances, like ever. I don't know how many takes that joint took, but like that shit was butter, like <laughs> absolute butter. And I'll say this, I don't know what Amy and Dan have planned for it because I was one of the people that talked to Rachel before as a fan of the show. And I was like, I love this relationship that you guys have, you know, where you can have two good looking people on screen 
who have a bond that goes beyond anything that's just physical or whatnot. And she's like, well, it might change. And so that I remember like when they were in that Miami club and like you guys just had to sit and look in each other's eyes while my man in the background was crooning like a mother. And, like, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> around and people are dancing like shit is hot and sexy. And then you just come to the two of you just like, boom. I'm like, oh shit, it's about to go. <laughs> I just wanted to fan out for a second and just say like the work. I, I mean, it always comes back to the work. The work is exceptional. So, Thank you, Sterling. You got it, brother. I said this to someone earlier, but the, as much as, you know, the, the pace of the show is set, it changes when Luke comes into the room and everyone's performances change in response to your magnetic energy. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. It feels like, and I can only really speak from my own experience, but it, it feels like a completely different side of Midge that I am not in control of. You know, it's, um, it's been one of the greatest of so many joys working on this show, getting to work with Luke, but also take a step back and watch that performance pour out. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the, the, for sure, the best compliment that we, we have gotten, and we've gotten from several sources, that we've gotten word from people who had seen Lenny Bruce live, um, and they just, they love it. I mean, they just, they just really love it. It was, it's a difficult thing to recreate an historical figure um, we, 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 we did it again with Wanda doing Mom's Mabley, which was, and we, we take it like really, really seriously. Recreating Lenny Bruce, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a high wire act and we needed the perfect, we needed the perfect actor and, uh, we, and we got the perfect actor. So true. And that's what I was saying about Maisel Bingo. I quit. Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I knew it. the mustache and that was it. Yeah. It was all over. You know, I, I, I knew Sally Marr, who was Lenny's mother. And Sally was about two feet tall and she was, she was taken care of by all the comics. All the comics were paying her bills and paying because because they considered you know he was the god and and she was supported by this this community of comics and there was a weird period i can't even i can't even remember why this was happening i think my dad wanted me to be a stand up which was <laughs> never going to happen but like every sunday i would have breakfast with her at the french market on santa monica boulevard and the french market used to have a little sliver store that that sold books and sold records and she would go and we, after breakfast we would go into that record store every week and she would look for and she would say do you have any lenny bruce albums and they would say no we don't she goes because i'm his mother and i wrote all his material and it happened every single week like every week they're like oh really oh that's great she goes i wrote every joke every joke that he said i wrote and i and it was like it was just like it was it was just a weird thing because a I, I don't think she wrote anything that he ever said, but she was a real trip and she was very, very interesting and very, very strong. And I don't think, I don't think it's that much of a leap to see as, as, as odd as his upbringing may have been, like that woman is going to sort of like instill a sort of respect for strong women in somebody and is going to make him, because I, in all the reading and everything and all the stories I've ever heard about him, um, there was never anything that felt sexist or, or in fact, it was just the opposite. He was sort of a cheerleader. Like if you were good, that's all he gave a shit about. He just gave a shit about if you were good or not. He had his own demons, but it was really, um, you know, and it's the Joan River story of him sending, if she bombed and him sending her the note saying, they're wrong, you're right. It, it sort of says everything about about Lenny Bruce. So I, you know, and then, I that, and then he looks very nice in the suit with the tie. He cleans <laughs> up good. Jane, sorry I'm bringing you into this so late. You are so freaking hilarious uh, as Sophie. 
uh, you have been ever since you've started playing the role, but you became a series regular in season three and just brilliant. There's, there's one scene in particular I want to call out. I know Alex doesn't really watch her scenes, but I'm curious, Jane, if you do, when Sophie's in the bathtub and she's on the phone with Susie and, she, you know, uh, Sophie's got her, her man butler or whatever, scrubbing her back. She's like lower, lower. And then Susie thinks that means talk in a lower tone and voice. And I literally spit out my water last night watching it, even though I've seen it before. It's just so genius. Do you watch these scenes back? What are they like? How do you even get through half the I stuff? I watch it in a loop. <laughs> you did? <laughs> she's, she's watching it now. Why do you think she's so distracted? I watch it for Alex. Yeah. <laughs> and I tell her how good we are. Well, Amy has us in the room when we do phone call scenes. So I was actually sitting right behind the light setup in the room while she's in that bathtub. So I, I was there and I got to watch her. So, so I they, remember Dan saying, oh, the dogs should be here. The dogs should be in this scene. And then someone said, don't worry, we'll put them in digitally. Yeah, it was Those too, dogs are horrible. It was too late. I came up Those with the dogs idea. Those such fuckers. I came up with the dogs. idea too late. So our visual effects department actually put the dogs in. The dogs were not really there. Ugh, and it actually dogs. saved us because those dogs are very problematic. Probably They're the fuckers. most They're problematic assholes. actors that they we were at, They were two little assholes mm. or big assholes. Yeah. So was, I, I just want to say one thing about Jane. The true brilliance of a comedian to me means that they're a brilliant actor also because there's a lot of very funny people out there who are great at stand-up and they are great at jokes but they are not actors necessarily and my heart breaks for jane so much when susie is yelling at her because she had it she had it in the palm of her hands she had the thing that she wanted and all she had to do was muster a little bit more bravado, a little bit more just bravery to go for it, and she would have done it. And she knew it, and she knew it. And the way Jane plays being yelled at by Alex, she's still haughty, she's still funny. You know, that Raisin in the Sun line is one of the funniest lines you've ever written in your entire life, and it's in that scene. But it, it, it's, it's that look away of like, she's just lost it and she had it that I just, I don't know, that that scene to me, it just says, I mean, I know I, everyone knows how funny Jane is, but God damn it, she's a great actress. It's just. Gosh, thank you very much. Here, 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 here. Absolutely. Jane, what was the most challenging part of playing Sophie this season? Oh, um, you know what, I, I mean, Dan and I talked about this uh, uh, at, a, at an earlier thing that we did. You know, I'm very familiar with that disease that Sophie has about acting where um, if she just girded her loins a little more, she could have made it through knocking over the table. So I, I, I and made it through the performance because that's what stops her. She just com completely becomes insecure. And as an actor, I have done that, especially younger. Hopefully I don't do it anymore. But um, <laughs> where you fall back on your old tricks. So I don't know that this is necessarily a challenge, but boy, was it great to actually use that experience of being a young actor where I, I, I'm not sure of myself and I've made choices and I stopped trusting them and I start doing waka waka. And I did that a lot uh, as a young actor. And I, so I know exactly what Sophie was going through. And I just thought it was brilliant that you, you put this into this character. And I, you know, it, it just feels so specific to like an actor. Um, an actor with, without any uh, uh, confidence. What they do, they go back to the old tricks and you know, stick a, a, a pillow in their outfit and, and start doing the jokes from you know, Sophie from Queens. Yeah, and Alex, talk to me about doing that scene also with Jane when you guys have it out after you know, her performance. And I, I really feel like we see Susie come into her own as a manager in that moment. She's not afraid to lose her client. Um, and then Jane, of course, your reactions say it all. It's brilliant. Just talk to me a little bit about doing that scene and, and what it was like. Well, I didn't um, have a pillow. That was my actual stomach. <laughs> <laughs> Saved us some money but, that way. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> she carbo-loaded before. <laughs> yeah. um, it's always a pleasure to work with Jane. I have such a good time. We have a good time together. 
we we really love to just fucking get it done and i we we it's really fun um yeah it was a lot of energy it was like running up the street and screaming i, I love fight scenes i love yelling at people and and but it was also painful it was also how much susie had on the line and and she didn't just flush her her chance down the toilet she flushed mine and moved me it was like shoots and ladders and i just hit that fucking giant shoot and went back to square one and and it was so painful um but then to kind of turn around and and see that i still had midge behind me and by my side i think is the only way that i could like get back on the game board and try to move forward again yeah, and it, it was two in the morning when we did that scene. We had to do it at night. It was right off of Times Square. It was noisy and there's blinking LED lights and there was a lot of stuff going on. So it was amazing that they were able to do that at two in the morning because I was basically falling asleep myself. But- um, Thanks. It, what, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but, you know, that was supposed to be the moment. What happened there is that it's the moment that Susie Meyerson understands what it means to take a job in this instance take on this client without any passion for the client she didn't have passion for this and she it blinded her she thought i can make some money off of this and then i can do midge and i can expand susie myers myers and associates but she didn't see the trap she fell into and and she's learned a valuable lesson in show business about about not having like extreme passion for everything that you do because you, you tend to get sunk when you don't have that passion you realize it in hindsight yeah um alex knows this as soon as the finale episode of season three just wrecked me um there were so many phenomenal scenes but after um susie has that confrontation with sophie outside and then of course we see um, Alex with Reggie when she's gambling and, and loses the match and realizes she's lost all of Midge's money. And then you go back, um, Alex, to your apartment and you break down in that chair. I emailed you after I finished watching the finale to say, I mean, you're always brilliant. And then you you even shocked me with that performance. It it wrecked me how you, how you did that. Um, I know you're so modest, but can you say like, how how did you get into that headspace as Susie? Because we've never seen her so broken before in that way. Um, yeah, stop emailing me. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I mean, Amy just says, this is what you have to do. And I did it like four times until she said, okay, you did it. I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 Alex did this. I, cause, cause I said like, you know, how do you want to do this? You want me to clear the set? Do you want, like, what do you need to get you into the space? And Alex goes, I, I, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. So Alex comes in, take one, comes in, sits down, falls apart, tears, sobbing, crying. We're all like, Oh my God, it's take one. She goes, and she's crying. And she goes, just like that. <laughs> that like literally it was like you asshole but like literally it was you know, she's being modest Alex Borstein is a sensational actress she really is I don't know how she did it on the because I could have gotten take one and I we could have like moved we, we I think we did it four times why um, and and a couple times we did it because she wanted to do it again. It wasn't me. Yeah. Because so just I'm just saying. Sometimes it ain't me. A lot of times it is, but sometimes it's not. But it was just it was there from the minute she walked in the door. So she's just a broken human being, and she she knew how to she knew how to get in touch with it. Okay. Last thing we have to talk about the the final scene in the finale when. Susie and Midge are on the tarmac and they run in to Reggie and Reggie breaks everybody's hearts by saying that Shy does not want Midge on tour again. Um, I believe. What? I believe he breaks his own heart too. I don't think he wanted to do that to, to Susie. No. Um, when, how did you come to make that decision to end the season on that note? Because it is so devastating. Why did you want to end it? 
Because that's showbiz. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> that that, that show is showbiz. I mean, Susie had that lesson with Sophie, <laughs> and this was Midge, especially finding out that there's no, you got to be very cautious about friendships in show business. And, and, it's, and they both learned a, another big lesson on that tarmac. Um, and you see, like, yeah, and, and the way Sterling played it, you know, we, 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 you know, you don't have to really direct Sterling on, on something like this. It was like, it, it was supposed to be a heartbreak for him. We had seen Reggie and Susie bond because we kind of both saw, you know, Susie is someone who kind of seems to have come from the gutter. She has a big blank space in her history that we might fill in one day that, and she was kind of a broken person when we met her in the pilot. Reggie is someone who has stuck with Shy. We've implied that maybe he had, he thought he could be in front of the camera. Yeah, Reggie's someone who put his dreams aside to take care of Shy. I mean, that's someone who went, I'm going to take care of you. This part of me is going to go over here. That's, that's, that's a lot to live with. So I think what worked is that you kind of saw the heartbreak on from all three of them. Um, and 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 it and that and that was the intent. It was supposed to be. You, you, the the friendships can shatter very roughly and very very quickly in show business. It's important and, to know who's on your side. Yeah, you just got to know who's on your side because oh one, it, it's a rough. God damn you, Borstein! I'm fucking getting <laughs> on a plane right now. Um, it's it's just it's 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 this was this was we thematically this was Midge's lesson lesson in showbiz. That's what the theme of this entire season was. Things are not as they seem. Shy was not what he seemed. Her relationship with Shy was not what it seemed, and. You know, uh, 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 Susie's relationship with Sophie was not what it seemed. Everything was not what it seemed. And at the end, it is, we wanted to leave it with this, the hard, cold facts in a bucket of water that says, you know, you got to wise up, kid. Because a lot of Midge, a lot of times Midge walks into things with her pretty eyes open and her skirt flaring and a great hat on her head. And it's like, I'm going to make things okay. And you know, sometimes you got to wise up a little bit. So we just wanted to wise her up a little bit. Well, I think on that note, I, like I said, you're all brilliant. Congrats on the nominations. Uh, Sterling, I think you made history with being uh, the first actor to be nominated in a uh, comedy and drama category, uh, which cool. is amazing. Well um, yeah, all of you. Thank you for everything and congrats on all the success and the joy that you bring to all of us through the screen. Well, thank you for doing this because in this really shitty time of the world of zombie apocalypse, we don't get to see our people and we don't get to see our friends and... We see a lot of just, each other though. <laughs> yeah, we see a lot of this. <laughs> it's really nice to see something else. Yes. Someone else. Thank you so much for joining us for this special Paley Fest Los Angeles conversation with the members of the wonderful cast and creative team of the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Thank you also to the festival's official card, City. We could not do this without you. And you can learn more about the Paley Center by visiting paleycenter.org. Take care, thank you, and stay safe.